Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. If you're familiar at all with the Heritage Foundation, the title of today's event and the composition of the panel may strike you as a bit unusual. The Inequality of the Equality Act concerns from the left. The left, has Heritage had a change of heart? <laughs> Not quite. Um, today's event came about here because no left-leaning institution was willing to host it. Uh, one of the organizers of today's event needs to remain anonymous because she has a teenage daughter four years into the process of transitioning. Throughout that time, she's been trying to get left-leaning media and think tanks and professional associations to take seriously the concerns coming from the left. And instead, she's found herself and her colleagues essentially deplatformed. Last month, she reached out to me to see if Heritage would be willing to provide a platform. Gladly. Our founder, Dr. Ed Fulner, is famous for saying that it's better to add and multiply than to divide and subtract. Undoubtedly, the people on this panel, like the people in this audience, disagree about many things. Uh, we likely disagree about abortion, marriage, taxes, trade, foreign policy, just to name a few. <laughs> and that's OK. Um, just because we disagree about some things, uh, possibly many things, that doesn't mean we disagree about everything. And where we do agree, we can and we should work together. Addition and multiplication, not division and subtraction. Gender identity refers to an individual's inner sense of being a man or a woman or both or neither. It exists along a spectrum and can be fluid. It's entirely arbitrary and self-disclosed and rather incoherent as it's not at all clear what it means to feel like a woman, or how I would know if I felt like one, or why my feeling like a woman, whatever that might mean, would make me a woman. And as a result, if gender identity becomes a protected class in federal civil rights law, there will be serious negative consequences. That's where we agree, and that's where we can work together. As I spoke with that anonymous mother um, last month about the possibility of a public event, several things became clear. First, the media wants to present the transgender cause as the next wave of civil rights and as the natural extension of the past decade of LGBT successes. If you support what the media cause marriage equality, you have to support trans equality. If you support what the media calls gay rights, you have to support trans rights. There's little willingness to recognize that the LGB and the T part of the acronym may be dissimilar, especially as applied to children. Second, the media wants to present this issue as one of science versus faith, that there's a consensus among doctors that people are born trans, that children as young as two or three years old can know their true gender identity, and that social transitioning and sex reassignment procedures, now referred to as gender affirmation, or gender confirmation are a safe and effective treatment protocol, and that the only people who could think otherwise must be acting based on bigotry or blind faith. Third, the media wants to ignore all of the costs. They don't care about the damage being done to young people's bodies and minds. In fact, they celebrate it as a civil right. They don't care about the privacy and safety and equality of girls when boys who identify as girls can share female-only spaces and when boys who identify as girls win athletic competitions against girls. They don't care about the ability of doctors to practice good medicine uh, when bad medicine becomes ban mandated as a civil right and when good medicine becomes prohibited as a civil wrong. And they don't care about the rights of parents who try to find the best care for their kids. Sadly, some religious people give support to these narratives when they agree to support gender identity policies in exchange for limited religious exemptions. But bad public policy doesn't become good by exempting yourself while imposing bad policy on everyone else. And a religious exemption does nothing for the privacy, safety, equality, and liberty of others. Gender identity ideology will impact everyone, right and left, conservative and liberal, religious and secular. And to give voice to these concerns from a perspective the media has tried to ignore, uh, that anonymous mother helped to assemble today's outstanding panel. First up is Jennifer Chavez, a feminist, secularist, lawyer, and mother. 
She has served on the board of the Women's Liberation Front for the last two years, where she helps coordinate its legal and policy strategies. Jennifer will be sharing stories from parents whose children suddenly began identifying as transgender. You may think these kids are rare. They used to be, but not anymore. Um, in this next slide, just last week, the CDC uh, released a report showing that 2% of all American high school students now identify as transgender. That's a population-wide statistic. The percentage is even higher in certain communities and schools. Girls are affected the most. In many Western countries, this has become an epidemic. Recently, the UK ordered an investigation into why the number of young, young girls seeking treatment at gender clinics increased 4,000%. You can see the data here from the UK um, Tavistock Clinic. Uh, you'll see that first year is 2009 to 2010. Cases for boys and girls uh, were around 50. Uh, today, 600 boys and over 1,400 girls being treated for gender dysphoria. As the CDC graphic showed, these young people, so let me go back. These young people, they feel unsafe, they feel attacked, and they're committing self-harm. We need to find better ways to support them without damaging their bodies for life. After Jennifer is Hashi Horvath, an expert in systematic review methods. He's a lecturer in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the Department of, uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. Hashi formally identified as transgender and presented as a woman for more than a dozen years. Then we'll hear from Julia Beck, a writer and organizer from Baltimore. She helps produce a monthly radio broadcast for Women's Liberation Radio News. Last year, she represented lesbians at Baltimore Pride and on the Law and Policy Committee of Baltimore City's LGBTQ Commission until she was kicked off the committee for daring to suggest that only females can be lesbians and that males who identify as women shouldn't be sentenced to women's prisons. Finally, we'll hear from Kara Dansky, a board member of the Women's Liberation Front. Kara will share with us how women and girls are legally erased and culturally harmed when gender identity ideology is enshrined in law. Please join me in welcoming today's panel. Good afternoon, everyone. When a child says he is transgender, we as a society have been taught to accept and celebrate this announcement. This is Jazz Jennings, a boy who identifies as a transgender girl. This is how the Jennings family celebrated the surgical removal of Jazz's penis last year when Jazz was only 17 years old. I just wanted to thank you all for coming to this farewell penis party. Um, you know, for 17 and a half years, I've lived with this body part that I have not wanted. And even though I've grown to love my penis for what it is, I'm happy to say goodbye. So let's cut it off! Yeah. Oh. But there are many parents who are not celebrating. They are suffering in silence. They know their children were not born in the wrong bodies and that hormones and surgeries are not the answers to their discomfort and confusion. Their stories are heartbreaking. I'm here to give those parents a voice. Here are their stories in their own words. I was shocked when my 13-year-old daughter told me that she was really my transgender son. She had no masculine interest and hated all sports. But as a smart, quirky teen on the autism spectrum, she had a long history of not fitting in with girls. Where did she get the idea she was transgender? From a school presentation, a school where over 5% of the entire student body called themselves trans or non-binary, where several students were already on hormones and one had a mastectomy at the age of 16. In my daughter's world, real life and online, transgender identities are common and hormones and surgeries are no big deal. I took her to a gender clinician seeking expert guidance. 
instead he accepted her new identity and told me i must refer to my daughter with masculine pronouns call her by a masculine name and buy her a binder to flatten her breasts no therapy no consideration of the social factors that obviously affected her thinking i was directed to put her on puberty blocking drugs and was falsely assured that these drugs were well studied and a perfectly safe way for her to explore gender. I was told that if I did not comply, she would be at higher risk of suicide. I have nowhere to go for proper help. Therapists are actively trained and socially pressured not to question these increasingly common identities. In Washington, D.C. and many states with so-called conversion therapy bans, just questioning a child's belief that she is the opposite sex is against the law. I have been living this nightmare for over four years, and despite my best efforts, my daughter plans to medically transition when she turns 18 later this year. Parents like me must remain anonymous to maintain our children's privacy, and because we face legal repercussions if our names are revealed. Parents who do not support their child's gender identity risk being reported to Child Protective Services and possibly losing custody of their children. In New Jersey, the Department of Ed Education officially encourages schools to report such parents. Meanwhile, the media glamorizes and celebrate, celebrates trans-identified children while ignoring stories like mine. I have written to well over 100 journalists begging them to write about what is happening to kids. I wrote to my representative and senators but have been ignored by their staff. My online posts about my daughter's story have been deleted and I have been permanently banned in an online forum. As a lifelong Democrat, I am an outraged by my former party and find it ironic that only conservative news outlets have reported my story without bias or censorship. We parents are ignored and vilified while our children are suffering in the guise of inclusivity and acceptance. I hope that some open-minded democratic lawmakers will wake up to the fact that they are complicit in harms to vulnerable kids and ask themselves this question. Why are physicians medicalizing children in the name of an unproven, malleable gender identity? And why are lawmakers enshrining gender identity into state and federal laws? My daughter, age 14, at age 14, spontaneously decided she is actually a male. After suffering multiple traumatic events in her life and spending a large amount of time on the internet, she announced that she was trans. Her personality changed almost overnight and she went from being a sweet, loving girl to a foul-mouthed, hateful, pansexual male. At first, I thought she was just going through a phase but the more I tried to reason with her, the more she dug her heels in. Around this time, she was diagnosed with ADHD, depression, and anxiety. But med mental health professionals seemed mainly interested in helping her process her new identity as a male and to convince me to accept the notion that my daughter is actually my son. At age 16, my daughter ran away and reported to the Department of Child Services that she felt unsafe living with me because I refused to refer to her using male pronouns or her chosen male name. Although the department investigated and found she was well cared for, they forced me to meet with a trans-identified person to educate me on these issues. Soon after, without my knowledge, a pediatric endocrinologist taught my daughter, a minor child, to inject herself with testosterone. My daughter then ran away to Oregon where state law allowed her at the age of 17 without my consent or knowledge to change her name and legal gender in court and undergo a double mastectomy and a radical hysterectomy. My once beautiful daughter is now 19 years old, homeless, bearded, in extreme poverty, sterilized, not receiving mental health services, extremely mentally ill and planning a radial forearm phalloplasty a surgical procedure that removes part of her arm to construct a fake penis. The level of heartbreak and rage I am experiencing as a mother is indescribable. Why does Oregon law allow children to make life-altering medical decisions? 
As a society, we are rightly outraged about female circumcision. So why are doctors who took an oath to first do no harm allowed to sterilize and surgically mutilate mentally ill, delusional children? In August of 2017, our seventh grade daughter came home from sleepaway camp believing she was a boy. She had a new vocabulary and a strong desire to change her name and pronouns. We never anticipated that we needed to ask the camp if she was going to be in a cabin with other females who were socially transitioning to boys. We suspect that our daughter assumed that since my wife and I are lesbians and liberal in our politics, that we would support this new identity. We may be lesbians, but we are not confused about biology. She tried to convince us with a very scripted explanation that she had always felt like a boy. But we had never once seen or heard from her any evidence of this new feeling. We listened to her, gave her the space to talk about her feelings, and tried hard not to convey to her that we were utterly horrified by this revelation. As we began to try to find information to make sense of this, we found evidence of a social contagion all over the internet. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit supplied a how-to guide and handbook on transitioning, complete with trans stars like Jazz Jennings and Riley J. Dennis, many with thousands of followers. We are in no way out of the woods. Some parents dealing with this, this issue view us as lucky because she is so young giving us and her more time to work through her discomfort. Maybe we will be, but we are facing this ever-growing storm of a social contagion without any help from mainstream media or the negligent FDA, not to mention the pathetic capitulation of our physicians and mental health professionals. My daughter spent her childhood happily engaging in what one would call typical girly activities with no gender stereotyping encouragement from us at all. Everything changed after she went to college. The environment of her new city and university celebrated transgender identities. She began speaking to us by phone of being non-binary, which I naively took to mean something like bisexual. Anxiety and depression then overwhelmed her. She dropped out <clears throat> and moved back to our hometown where she resumed psychiatric care for pre-existing mental health conditions. Her appearance, always feminine, changed dramatically. A shaved head, boy's clothes, and obvious unhappiness were now her camouflage from the world. She went from non-binary to claiming that she was really a boy. She parroted online advice. Quote, I always knew something was wrong, but didn't have words for it until I started watching videos on Tumblr and YouTube. When I was little, I was afraid to tell you that I didn't feel right, end quote. This narrative matched nothing about her past, but I was still naive. Because her psychiatrist did not consider her to be transgender, I assumed she would be unable to get a referral for the testosterone she was determined to start. I was wrong. In only one visit and with just a little bit of blood work, Planned Parenthood will cheerfully enable young women and men to pursue their authentic selves through cross-sex hormones. All that's needed is a few bucks and signing a form that the risks have been disclosed and understood. That is the route my daughter took at the tender age of 20, bypassing her psychiatrist altogether. My husband wrote to Planned Parenthood, explained her mental health history, and providing her doctor's name and telephone number. Planned Parenthood's lawyer wrote back curtly that they presume anyone over 18 is capable of giving informed consent. No matter what anyone thinks of Planned Parenthood's other services, the fact that they will instantly prescribe powerful hormones with many unknown long-term effects, especially to people with underlying mental health issues, should shock the conscience. People need to know this is new Planned Parenthood's new line of business. At the age of 17, after immersion on Tumblr and after two of her oldest and closest friends in high school declared themselves transgender, our daughter told us that she is really a guy. Her therapist diagnosed her as high functioning on the autism spectrum. The therapist was also quite clear that he would 
lose all control over the medicalization once our daughter turned 18. As a federal employee, I couldn't find health insurance that doesn't cover hormones for self-declared gender dysphoria. My daughter is now 20, has been on testosterone for a year, and has made an appointment for a consult about a double mastectomy. All this, even though she can't legally buy an alcoholic drink. I can't get any answers from doctors in response to my questions and concerns about the risks of these treatments. I get no answers from mental health professionals about what makes these treatments appropriate or what makes my daughter different from those young women who are no longer trans and have detransitioned, sometimes after being on hormones for years. Having watched these adults enable my daughter to do this with no medical science to back it up is a scenario that I never dreamed any parent would have to face, at least not in the US. But this is our reality now, a reality that the mainstream media won't touch. So. So there's, let me give a little backup uh, before we get to this slide. Uh, if you read uh, the scientific articles about the origin or the sort of the basis of transgenderism, you'll see that there's a strong emphasis in that it's, oh, it's biological, it's something innate. You have, there's some kind of gender identity that, that everybody has and it's just that some people are born uh, born this way, they ha they have a built-in, uh, you know, they're the opposite sex in their brains, you know, like Bruce Jenner. Um, this is based on um, the assertions of a few psychologists. It's not based on any scientific evidence and no the research. It's just uh, in the 60s they began just saying, well, yeah, it's it's built in. It's part of their who they are, and that just kind of took hold. And and it's not based on anything. And so over the course of uh, the past 30 years, they've been looking at people's brains and thinking about what about hormones in utero and all these various ways that people might have had their gender identity scrambled. And uh, it, it all looks very nice when you read the paper. They say, whoa, there's tantalizingly close evidence and it's uh, very, very suggestive of uh, uh, some association here. It's spin and if you read it carefully, uh, there's nothing really in there that connects. There's enormous gaps, it takes a huge uh, leap of faith to even uh, say that there's anything connected. There's probably 10 or 20 other more likely explanations for any associations they do see. So they just selectively choose these outcomes and pretty much all of the science investigating that is an exercise in confirmation bias and selection bias where they're just trying to, we have an idea, this is how we, we think this is happening. Of course, we want this to be what we're showing. Um, so so in, in the 60s, uh, you know, after after maybe you know 20 or 30 years of, of a few adults piping up and saying, "Oh, I think I'm the opposite sex," you know, uh, they began to think, "Wow, these these kids, you know, what, what about when they were kids? Maybe we can catch these kids early." And I guess in after the 50s, the, uh, transsexualism was played out in the media. There was a, a big case uh, in Denmark, who or actually was an American who went to Denmark, and it was all over the mass media. They started making films. Some like it hot. You had all this. Exp exp um, exploration of, of gender, you know, uh, a lot of films, Myra Breckenridge and, and uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of different films began looking at gender stuff. And, and so was, people were thinking about it. And so they brought their kids in who, when they would be playing around with, uh, you know, the boy would put on his mom's shoes, the girl would want to climb a tree or something. And they'd bring these kids into the, uh, to the doctors who would be very intrigued, like, oh, the gender identity of these kids, we've got to see if we, if we can alternately try to prevent transsexualism um, or s later begin to steer them into it. So in the Netherlands, they got the idea based on the sad sob stories of uh, older transsexuals who had had surgery and the, what miserable childhoods they'd had as, as the opposite sex uh, in their brains. Um, they thought, what if we just block their puberty? That might be good. Buy them time to explore. Um, never mind that since then, um, I think all children who have begun a, a course of puberty blockers have continued with the process. They don't go off it. And, and uh, so in, in the Netherlands, they specify, uh, they start around 11 or 12 with the blockers and in hormones around age 15 or 18. Um, but of course in the United States, they start much earlier. 
they start or the blockers around eight or nine because you never know. I mean, basically, if you have kids taking this and, and you say, we're just checking it out, you know, you, you might really be, a boy might really be a girl, a girl might really be, be a boy. They're thinking, okay, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, the opposite sex and they're just getting entrained into this whole pattern. Um, and so it's a one-way one -way trip, you know, you don't go off these things. And even if you do, what, do you, what happens? You know, the, the boy is three inches shorter, his voice hasn't broken, the girl hasn't developed, she hasn't had menstruation. All of her peers have. They don't change back. They don't say, okay, well, actually, I'm really this one. Um, I want to mention, I don't think I put this in the slides, that, that we're talking about two different streams of children. There's, there's um, the smaller children who, you know, are just playing around with clothes or, you know, the girl wants to climb a tree, the boy wants to play with dolls. And given uh, the, the public consciousness uh, through the media of, of transgender, Instead of just saying, wow, okay, you're just playing around or, or you know, it's not a big deal, or maybe you're gay, um, it, they rush them to the gender clinics, of which there are, I think, more than 50 in the United States now. Pediatric gender clinics I'm talking about, uh, funded by multimillionaires who may themselves be transgender or are transgender. And um, so there's the stream of the children and the blockers, where from the age of about two, uh, they, they're brought in and, and some are encouraged to, to do a social transition in San Francisco. That's the big popular thing. It's a one-way trip. If a boy starts wearing dresses at age three and says you're a girl and you play with the girls now, he doesn't go back to start, wait a minute, I'm a boy. I mean, normally, normally they would, but they're given these blockers from about eight or nine and that just cements it. Then they're on a trip. So that's the one stream and the other stream is rapid onset gender dysphoria, or it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a mass craze going on in the world right now where teenagers and young adults, um, predominantly girls, young women, uh, are just suddenly coming, as she described, just suddenly announcing, I think I'm trans. And so it's, it's uh, let's see what I got there. Oh, we're back on the blockers. Uh, it, it's, um, right. They just suddenly hype up with this and, and everybody is expected to go along with it. And because nobody wants to be a bigot, nobody wants to do the wrong thing accidentally and you know, nobody wants to misgender anybody. I mean, everybody's thinking about these things now when these are just made up constructs. And uh, the gender identity, is, it's, it's like, it's the new uh, eating disorder. It's the new goth or you know, it's, it's maybe a little more serious than that because medic medical, interventions are involved. Uh, and, but that's where it starts out. It's on the level of a social kind of thing where you, you know, your friends are, are you know, one of your friends is, I'm trans, I think, I'm non-binary. I saw a TV show. Uh, over and over you hear stories where they're saying, yeah, I saw this show and it really clicked with me that, that, um, that maybe I'm trans. And what's really happening is the, the, uh, the, the young girls, uh, have a kind of internalized misogyny or internalized homophobia or they're in, internalized sort of like uh, safety, they want safety, it's, uh, they've, they've traumatized, you know, they've been, men have been hitting on them or worse and they're, and they're just want refuge and maybe I'll be a boy. So there's a variety of reasons that girls get into it. Um, the young boys might have the beginnings of autogynephilia, which is, is a paraphilia that is sort of encouraged in society through pornography and through uh, just sexualization of, of, of everything, of cross-dressing is in pu the public, uh, in the media. So the boys have the beginnings of, of, of this kind of uh, a fetish in a way, and it progresses and it pretty soon they, they internalize it that, wow, maybe I really have a, maybe I have a feminine gender identity. Maybe I'm a girl inside. And it, it steamrolls from there uh, and, and in the old days, it might have just been sort of self-limiting, but now it, you can act on it while you're before you're mature. So that's the two streams: the children who their parents kind of put them in there, and, and the old clinicians in the '60s used to check check out the parapsychology or <laughs> parapsychology psychopathology of the parents, and often found that that um, they would discern mm, borderline cyst symptoms in these parents. You know, you'd look at the why are the parents bringing these kids in here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but not anymore. Now it's this wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, so uh, let me see what we have any slides. I think I'm just going to go extemporaneously. Um, 
So with the, the blockers, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it stops them from growing, it stops them from pr pr maturing physically, and it also, because puberty is more than just your genitals changing. It's, it's your mind, it's a socialization, you have you know, your, your, your peers, and, and if you're, you know, as I say, if, if, you're, if you think you're the opposite sex and you're being on that train already for a few years, it's really very difficult to get off, and, and, and uh, uh, most don't. I think don't, none do, and those that do disappear. Do they commit suicide? Nobody knows, it's never, never checked. Um, that's the other thing about trans medicine, is if, in, if they ever uh, look with their populations of uh, uh, people they've put through the process, a few years later, check on them. If they ever find, um, you know, most of them, it's, they usually miss about 30%, 30, 40, 50%. Uh, loss to follow up, no big deal. I mean, with HIV, if you had 30 to 40% loss to follow up, it would be an emergency. It's considered, oh, they've, they've moved on with their lives or something. You know, they don't want to participate in our study anymore. They're fine. Uh, you know, when you have this, that many loss to follow up and that many suicides that they're reporting, you have to wonder, is there a connection? We don't know. It, so many of these young people, and really there's been thousands, uh, we saw that, that, that chart from the UK with uh, uh, a couple thousand kids. Well, imagine that in every English-speaking country, and, and, and mostly it's English-speaking countries, I think. Um, the United States is just extrapolate from that British figure. It's many thousands, 50 gender clinics, come on. Um, so they are now able to get their surgeries at 15 in Oregon, uh, and with the parents' consent, they're, they're getting... Um, mastectomies at 13 years old in Los Angeles. There's a doctor called Dr. Joanna Olson Kennedy who has a study, uh, it's funded by the NIH, and she refers young girls to the surgeons as young as age 13 for radical mastectomy. And the world cheers, it's considered cutting edge and wonderful, and uh, she's very proud of it. You can talk, see her on her videos. Um, it's really pretty disturbing. Um, um, the boys can have their genital surgeries from about 16, and there's some hint that it might even be 15. Uh, the doctors want to get them while they're still in high school. There's a paper even out where they've surveyed the doctors to see what they, what they think. How young is too young is the title of the paper. They want to get, to get the boys while they're still in school because They'll probably still be living at home. The parents can help with the extensive aftercare that takes months and it's extremely intensive and it, lots, lots can go wrong. Because if it, when they're 18, they want to go out and party, they're at college or something, and more things go wrong. So can you imagine the doctors are thinking, how can we get to them before they're 18 and have these genital surgeries? So it's, the, it's really, the barn doors are wide open. I mean, really, they, they're just going, going for broke. And uh, society is, uh, sort of indoctrinated to, to, to now think this is human rights. And I don't wanna say the wrong thing here. I mean, I can hardly imagine what doctors must be thinking. I mean, just general practitioners around the country who refer their patients to the gender clinics. That, I mean, these are people who are trained to be critical and to have um, differential diagnoses. I mean, no, you can't read everything. They can't keep up with the latest of this in the papers. Do they just say, well, it's, I mean, I'm surprised to hear you have that this is true, that people can have an innate gender identity and actually be the opposite sex, and that it's fine to put them through these, these, these surgical changes. But I'll go along with it, because I don't have time to read all the science or look at it critically. You know, but as I say, if you look at it critically, very critically, you can see right through the spin and just see, you see they're talking about A, D, and B and C are missing, but somehow A is now connected to D. So, um, Anyway, I think you get the idea from what I'm saying. The science is complete junk, and people go along with it just because they don't know how to uh, assess bias in a study and uh, you know what's the value of this, evidentiary, evidentiary value of this, and how, how likely is it to be um, just complete crap? Well, it's, it's really likely. And, and uh, <clears throat> the sort of tendency in, in people to want to do the right thing, 
whether they're liberal or conservative, they want to do the right thing. They, they can't keep up with everything. It's pretty surprising, but you know, we've had a lot of societal changes. So, okay, everybody's transgender. You can be transgender, non-binary, whatever. This is all a bunch of nonsense, and uh, we have to stop it. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of children now are going through this. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia Beck. I live in Baltimore City, and I am a lesbian. You might be thinking to yourself, why is a lesbian speaking of the Heritage Foundation? And I ask myself the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but my answer is pretty simple. There is no place for me. I am politically homeless. So believe me when I say I am grateful for the opportunity to share my story. Thank you to the organizers, to my fellow panelists, and everyone here for making this happen. My story is as unbelievable and absurd as it is commonplace. I got kicked off of the Baltimore mayor's LGBTQ commission as the only lesbian simply for stating biological facts. After a months long witch hunt, I was found guilty of violence. My crime? using male pronouns to talk about a convicted male rapist who identifies as transgender and prefers female pronouns. It doesn't matter that he sexually assaulted two women in a women's prison after being transferred there on account of his gender identity. Oh no, it is far more criminal for me to call a male rapist he than it is for him to rape. The man who led my inquisition also identifies as transgender. He is the president of the Baltimore Transgender Alliance and claims to be a lesbian. I find that almost funny, almost funny, um, because everything he does makes life for women, girls, and lesbians worse. Last June during Pride Week, his organization, the BTA, sponsored a public event where lesbians would be, quote, hung by their necks, end quote. He advocates for commercial sex work, of which he has no experience as a white trust fund baby. He also inhibits the work of on the ground women organizations for not using inclusive language. I joined the LGBTQ commission to give lesbians a voice in our local government to advise the mayor on our, on our underrepresented issues I was reviewing proposals, speaking at town halls, and sharing very detailed notes with everyone on my committee. After a few meetings, I ran for a leadership position, and I won. I was one of two co-chairs on the Law and Policy Committee, but that did not last long. After the BTA president accused me of transphobia, the mayor's liaison swiftly scheduled an emergency meeting to assess my fitness as a leader. The meeting went worse than you can imagine. I was not allowed to talk out of turn. Uh, one by one, members of my committee, representatives of the BTA, and three brave friends went around the table speaking their minds. One gay man at the meeting said, biological sex was a thing of the past. <laughs> I looked at him and asked, how can we be homosexual if sex is fake? Um, <laughs> I kid you not, that really happened. <laughs> Another gay man disagreed with the dictionary definition of woman as adult human female. These men could not support their flimsy arguments. The next speaker, though, she broke my heart. <laughs> she had just survived a hysterectomy, shaking and, shaking and complaining of hot flashes. She said she was not and had never been a woman. Quote, it doesn't make me any less of a man that I have a vulva. It's there and it's masculine and it's a male and it's a man, end quote. As she said this, my accuser snapped his fingers as if we were at a poetry reading. It was so fake and performative, he didn't care at all for what she had endured in the name of gender identity. He snapped because it made him look like an ally. Hours went by, but I insisted that sex might be actually important to our work, as it definitely is to my sexuality. 
but their decision was made long before that night, and I was voted out. The meeting made one thing crystal clear. Inclusivity means all voices are welcome, except women's, except lesbians. It's unfortunate that so many people are truly confused about gender and sex, so I'd like to break it down right now. There are only three sexualities, homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, um, all the hip new identities in the alphabet soup, like non-binary, gender fluid, pansexual, are not actually sexualities. Neither is transgender. Yet everything is about the T now, entirely eclipsing the L, G, and B. The T is diametrically opposed to the first three letters in the acronym, and especially to the L. Sexualities are based on sex, but gender identities are based on stereotypes. They have nothing to do with same-sex attraction. In fact, they undermine and erase homosexuals. People are not attracted to genders. Yet every lesbian I know has been pressured to accept males into our dating pools and dwindling spaces. In order to validate their gender identity, men who call themselves trans women try to break the, quote, cotton ceiling, which refers to lesbians' underwear. The completely illogical statement that trans women are women is recited like a big brother mantra in every leftist space. No one really believes it. But saying so will jeopardize your career, your community, and your life. Sex and gender are not the same. People like to be polite and say gender instead of sex, and often use the terms interchangeably as if they were synonyms. But they mean different things, and we must not conflate them. Sex is a biological reality. It's not a dirty word. It refers to the two reproductive classes in our species. Even people with disorders of sexual development, commonly called intersex conditions, are either one sex or the other. To deny this fact means we are unable to name, address, and fix systemic sex-based oppression and exploitation. Many well-intentioned people think that this concept of gender identity is the next frontier of social justice, but in reality, it is regressive. Gender is based on rigid sex roles that legitimize male dominance and female subordination. The idea of a female or male brain only justifies treating women as subhuman. Gender cements sexist stereotypes. Women like me, who don't wear makeup or high heels, do not conform to gendered expectations of femininity. And that's okay. Women don't need to wear makeup or high heels in order to be women. Our female sex is the one and only qualifier of womanhood. But today, many young girls are told that they are born in the wrong body if they do not embrace femininity. It used to be that if you did not follow traditional gender roles, being the perfect pretty princess or mean macho boy, then conservatives would try to change your personality to match your body. But now it's worse. Liberals are trying to change your body to match your personality. As a lesbian, using a radical feminist analysis, I want to do away with both. I want all people to love themselves and live however they want in the bodies that they were born as. Girls who play with trucks and like the color blue, boys who play with dolls and like the color pink, children with autism, children who would likely grow up to be happy gay adults, are now being sterilized for defying sex stereotypes. Teenage girls are binding their breasts, shooting up foreign hormones, and undergoing dangerous invasive surgeries. Many of these girls decide it's easier to move through the world seen as a boy rather than as a girl. And I don't blame them. Being a woman is not always fun. But the joy of sisterhood, of loving women, even as friends, is something that no doctor can supply. We are losing an entire generation of sisters to this madness. That's why it's personal. It's infuriating, it's devastating, and I have had enough. I'm here because I care about women, and I expect that you do too.
don't want to follow that. <laughs> so I'm here to talk a little bit about the law and about how uh, the organization that I'm a part of, which is Women's Liberation Front, has been engaging in some aspects, both on in the, in the courts in litigation as well as on the legislative side. And I will also just say, in addition to being a member of the Women's Liberation Front, which is a far left radical feminist organization, I'm also a member of Hands Across the Aisle, which is um, which is a bipartisan coalition of women who disagree, as Ryan said earlier, profoundly on many issues. And we set those aside because we have many shared concerns about the impacts of gender identity ideology, specifically for women and girls. So going back to May 2016, going back further, we, we have, um, oh, let me. So let me also say, um, most people in the room probably know there's a law on the books called Title IX, which is Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, and its intention specifically is to protect women and girls in the educational arena because women and girls had been excluded from and discriminated in against within the educational arena for so long. So feminists and other women fought very hard to get Title IX enacted into law in 1972, and it is specifically to protect women and girls, and it says that in the educational arena, there can be no discrimination on the basis of sex, it specifically uses that word. And Title IX accompanies some implementing regulations that say that even though the law prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, it is appropriate for institutions that receive federal funding to have sex segregated spaces like bathrooms and locker rooms. So sex segregated spaces are specifically, uh, um, they're allowed under Title IX and its implementing regulations. Okay, so fast forward to May 2016, then President Obama issued what was called a guidance letter to institutions that receive Title IX funding. And what that guidance said was that institutions that receive federal funding under Title IX were supposed to interpret the word sex in Title IX to mean gender identity. The Obama administration did this with no notice and comment. There was no opportunity for the public to respond. And what that guidance effectively would have done is obliterated the regulations that allow for sex segregated spaces. So the Women's Liberation Front sued. Uh, we filed a lawsuit in New Mexico called the Women's Liberation Front versus the United States of America. And we were, we were well prepared to proceed with that lawsuit. And we, we essentially made two arguments. One is that uh, the Obama administration's failure to get any public input into this change constituted a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. And further, we argued that interpreting the word sex to mean gender identity for Title IX purposes was really, really bad for women and girls in institutions that received federal funding. Those were our arguments. The current administration has withdrawn that guidance. And so as, as a result of the withdrawal of that guidance, our case was dismissed. With our permission, we understood our case just became moot with the guidance not in place. However, schools across the country are very, very confused because even though they understand that that guidance is no longer in place, there's still a lot of evolving questions about how schools are supposed to deal with claims of discrimination brought by trans-identified students. And so what we're seeing is across the country, some trans-identified students are suing their schools and their school boards and their school districts. And this litigation is sort of percolating up through the courts. And we don't have a definitive word from the Supreme Court yet. Uh, when, even though our lawsuit was dismissed, we have, Women's Liberation Front has continued to engage in litigation efforts by filing front of the court briefs. We did that in the case that some of you may have heard of called Gloucester. It's a case in Virginia uh, that's in federal court. We've done it in a few state court cases, and we did it in this case. This is called Boyertown. Uh, Boyertown versus, uh, sorry, it's called Joel Doe versus Boyertown Area School District. So in this case, a group of students actually sued their school arguing the opposite. So in most of the cases that we see, it's a trans-identified school suing, trans-identified student suing their school when the school has not allowed the student access to opposite sex spaces. Boyertown is different. In Boyertown, a group of students who want sex segregated spaces sued their school because this young woman walked into the girls' room and there was a boy. And she didn't like that. She was concerned about that for her own safety and she was concerned about that for the safety of her sister and other girls in the school. And so she decided she wanted to sue. She's incredibly brave. Her name is Alexis Lightcap. 
And of the students who schooled the Boyertown School, Alexis is the only one with the bravery to use her name publicly. And she's written about this in local media, and she's fantastic. Why is this such a concern? So I get this question from my liberal friends and family all the time. They think I'm crazy. They're like, why do you care if somebody wants to identify as the opposite gender? Of course, they can never explain what they mean by identify as the opposite gender, and even that formulation totally conflates the words sex and gender, which I think is inappropriate and illogical. But my liberal friends and family are always asking me, why do you care? But the reason that I care is really, first of all and foremost, because of the parents whose stories Jennifer read, who are struggling so hard with this in their own families. But I also really care because if sex is construed to mean, if, if sex is construed to mean gender identity, what that means is that nearly all sex segregated spaces, colleges, sports, dormitories, and women's rights in general will utterly disappear. They will completely disappear. And that is true whether, um, whether the Supreme Court decides that sex means gender identity, which it might. Uh, we hope it won't. Boyertown uh, may go before the Supreme Court. We filed an amicus brief in support of the, of the petition for certiorari, and we're hoping that the Supreme Court will take it up in this case, in part because Alexis is so brave and is, she is standing firm for women's uh, rights, privacy, and safety. Um, but whether the Supreme Court decides that sex means gender identity or the legislature decides that sex means gender identity, that is an unmitigated disaster for women and girls. It is horrifying. It means effectively that women and girls will no longer exist as a coherent category worthy of civil rights protection, and that is an absolute disaster for us. So. Okay, so the court might decide that. We hope, it, we, we hope the court will decide that sex means what most of us think it means, which is how Julia defined it. Um, we're also looking at the, at the legislature, where there's a bill pending before both houses of Congress called the Equality Act. We think that is a problem because we think equality is a very good thing. Who would be against equality? Everybody likes equality. So this very innocuous sounding bill would amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the legacy of Dr. King. It would amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act to include gender identity as a legally protected category for, for civil rights purposes in places of public accommodation. This would utterly obliterate female-only spaces throughout society. The Equality Act would also require institutions that receive federal funding, which is many institutions in this country, it would require them to consider sex to mean gender identity for all purposes. So the Equality Act, which sounds all well and good, is an unmitigated disaster for women and girls. And the thing is, it is not possible to both enshrine gender identity in civil rights law and protect women and girls as a distinct legal category at the same time. It's just not possible. So with the Equality Act, though, Democrats have largely embraced it, I, I think because they're well-intentioned and they support equality, equality is a good thing. But I really don't think that Democrats in Congress have fully explored the potential consequences of what this law would mean if enacted. And I hope that they will. Okay, so finally, this is not about the law. This is more about really the intellectual bankruptcy of gender identity ideology and the importance of language. No one really knows what these words mean. I have never gotten a definition of gender identity that is not either completely circular. The Equality Act essentially defines gender identity as the, as the gender that you identify with. That's completely and <laughs> utterly circular. And it tells us nothing about what it means. Or other definitions of gender identity rely on regressive, outdated stereotypes, sex-based stereotypes that have no place in our society from a feminist perspective. People will say, a, a, a man who quote unquote identifies as a woman will say he does so because he's nurturing and compassionate and he likes to wear dresses. That's absurd. And it's frankly, it's insulting to women who have fought hard to get into the workplace, to, um, to, to wear what we want, to look how we want to look, to not wear makeup if we don't want to wear makeup, it is incredibly insulting to say 
that a woman is someone who wears makeup and dresses. Yet, a lot of people will define, a lot of people on my side of the aisle will define gender identity in that way. So, essentially, gender identity is just utterly intellectually bankrupt. It really doesn't have any meaning, and we should not be basing civil rights laws on concepts that have no coherent meaning. Feminists have fought really hard for our rights to vote, to serve on juries, to have sex segregated spaces, and we're not giving them up easily. Okay, so we're technically a little over time, but we're gonna stretch this um, time a little bit so we have time for some questions and answers. Um, so there are two microphones, one in each, maybe we only have, yep, there is a second microphone, two microphones. Um, I will call people, uh, please um, ask a question, end with a question mark, uh, no speechifying. Uh, we'll go right here in the front row, um, right here. Is there any reason not to refer to the Equality Act as the Female Erasure Act? No. <laughs> Let's do that, please. <laughs> Female Erasure Act. I mean, we, we can't amend the title, but <laughs> we can refer to it that way, absolutely. Yep, uh, Dylan. Um, this is for Ms. Dansky. Um, the EEOC's website still defines uh, sex, I, or sex discrimination to include gender identity and sexual orientation. Is that a lag in the, um, so you said the current administration rescinded the Obama administration's guidance on defining sex, but it still says that it enforces it that way. Is that a lag or is that just the way that it still is? Because I can understand why this is confusing because it's confusing for somebody who's actually trying to research it and understand it. So I have not seen the EEOC's website, but I don't doubt at all what you're saying, and it, that's probably an EEOC policy. But the withdrawal of the guidance, the guidance was never enacted into law. It was simply an administrative issuance to Title IX institutions, but it was never, it, was, it never was enacted into law. So different agencies have different policies on this, but we do see gender identity creeping in all over the place in agency regulations, uh, it's, it's in district, regu district of Columbia local regulations. So we see it everywhere and it's, it's not surprising to me that you're having trouble making sense of it because it makes no sense. Okay. Other questions, yes. Talking about the ideology, uh, doesn't a lot of, hasn't a lot of this come out of academia in terms of uh, professors like Ann Fausto Sterling, Judith Butler, Eve Sedgwick Kosofsky? Is isn't, isn't this a monster that was built in the laboratory of academia? I think in, uh, in large part, yes. It's just, uh, uh, it, it's an ideology that uh, they proposed uh, these gender identity and, and, and it's sort of extrapolated from, from gay rights and other things that they sort of latched onto that. And trans activists also became uh, much more energetic after, after the 80s, I would say, to, and, and also bec became members of academia themselves. And, um, you know, it, it's just uh, spiraled from there. Uh, just to add to that, the trans, I trans ideology stems from uh, a larger field called queer theory and it's it would just i couldn't possibly do it justice right now but um look it up um, see what it's all about right. resist it at every chance you get right uh, everybody is queer in some way so they, they even include under the trans umbrella they put masculine women you know so just a, a, any woman who who dresses in a masculine way is considered under the trans thing according to the queer ideology uh, yep. Hi, thank you guys so much. Uh, Twofold question. One, we've got a diverse crowd, but I, I think, I think even people who are conservative-leaning 
found all these insights very compelling. Could you all give some counsel? Um, it, look, we're in a divided time, I think that's fair to say, a polarized time in our country, sadly. Uh, if people are concerned about this, could you give sort of some pointers as to how we can facilitate you know, cooperation to put forth a unified front? And the second part of the question is, I've interviewed pediatric endocrinologists who have told me of that a standard weakness in the endocrine community is that doctors are just so busy, they don't know what's going on. Meanwhile, professional associations have just overhauled these guidelines and now they just defer to it. Could you speak maybe to why there is such widespread ignorance among physicians or maybe even people in your field, Hashi, about yes. epidemiology, why people just don't know? Yeah, I, I, I really think, I mean, either they are just such ideologues that they think it, this should be, you know, people, there should be more trans people. And of course, the trans activists say that they, they think it's just as valid to be transgender and go through all the surgery and stuff. It's an equal life path for, for them, uh, and children should be entitled to have it because it's a right. Um, and so I, I really think that doctors just can't keep up with everything. They must, I just imagine they have good intentions. Not everybody is crazy. They just don't have time to read it. They might be surprised that, wow, people have an opposite sex gender identity. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really, a, there's no other way to explain it. I mean, there must be some people who are just committed to making it happen and then others who just can't help it. I, I think the way to, to um, begin to change it, and first off, we have to get this gender identity out of the, equal, the Women Erasure Act. Um, <laughs> but, but also is, is to not play along. I don't play along. I don't, I don't say trans woman. I don't say she, her. I don't care if it hurts their feelings. This is reality, and it gaslights everybody else. If we have to gaslight yourself, and you begin to internalize it, like, okay, she, she, she. it's not a fucking she. Sorry, I can't help it. It's you just say it in reality, English language. What is happening here, and and don't play along with it. So I just don't play along. I won't. And if it's illegal, I, and I haven't been to New Jersey or Canada lately. But, um, or Ontario, I guess they have, you can go to jail for misgendering somebody. New York City, be fined quarter million dollars if you misgender somebody, your colleague or something. Um, it's nonsense. And it gaslights everybody. And in five years, I mean, just imagine what's going to happen when China picks up on this, you know. It's, it's, it's just going to be, it is already out of control. It's going to be a lot worse if we let this happen. So I would urge you all, don't play along. I, I would like to just quickly add that... Um, in addition to that, um, you know, if you want to pick up the book Galileo's Middle Finger, you can see this story, a relatively recent story, of one of the leading um, uh, physicians who studied uh, transgender ideology or uh, uh, transsexuality, really, and the way that he was attacked um, very personally and very viciously um, until he lost his job. And so I think that doctors and everybody, everyone who's here has a reason to be concerned that we will be attacked in our jobs or in our personal lives, lose friends, lose, um, you know, lose family even. Um, I think we have to all start trying to give cover to each other and make room for there to be questioning. And there has to be that kind of um, making room within the medical profession where more and more people need to just speak up and create space for the questioning so that every time it happens, that person isn't just slammed down. So I really like what Jennifer said about giving cover to each other. I think that's really important. And what I have heard from some of my Republican friends is two things about how conservatives are thinking about this. And you can tell me if I've got this wrong. But one thing is that um, many conservatives think that gender identity ideology is just so ridiculous that the Equality Act will never get through. And well, OK. But the other thing is that Republicans in general do not understand what we are all up against here. Feminists understand the unbelievable power and the, the, the money behind the movement to promote gender identity. It is massive, and we, we need to be prepared for a major fight. I'd like to speak to your first question also. Um, one thing that we can do as people, as individuals, is just meet with each other. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your family. You're gonna lose friends. It's going to happen, um, but that is a risk that we should be willing to take. Um, and I would also advise to move away from the internet, get off, get off Facebook, get off Twitter. That's not where great discussions happen. 
Great discussions happen when we get face to face. So meet with people in person. Okay, we're only gonna have time for uh, two more questions. So we'll go to Professor Hadley Arcus and then uh, in the back row there. Uh, Professor Arcus is here in um, the middle, sorry. My question is in the same vein. You know, Phyllis Shafley, about 40 years ago, led a powerful movement to resist ERA. This has been one of the most powerful panels I've ever seen. And I wonder, what, is there a possibility of an alliance that would knit together the groups you mentioned to form a national group of resistance that would stand up? It might even impart testosterone to the Republicans. <laughs> 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 well, that's really the intention behind Hands Across the Aisle. It's, it's women really working together to do this. I mean, you can make one. <laughs> Why you do it? You know? We need men. And you we know, need women, men on our team. Women and have so led this you. by just overwhelmingly women have been resisting this. And men are picking up on it slowly. And it's really shocking how many men on the Internet are defending the whole trans thing. Straight men are, are all about the trans. And you have to wonder what the heck is going on. Um, it, it, this is a men's rights movement. Mm -hmm. This is really a men's trans rights, rights movement. rights movement is, yeah. 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 So yeah, men have to get more involved and we have to uh, be talking to each other and educating each other um, and, and, and joining the efforts of the women who have really done 99% of it so far. Let me just add, uh, before we go to that last question, that about a year and a half ago, we hosted an event um, in this auditorium. It was the first public event for the Hands Across the Aisle uh, Coalition. And so if you were to do a Google search for heritage, Hands Across the Aisle, and biology isn't bigotry, that was the title of the event, uh, it featured um, four women, two from the political right side of the spectrum, two from the political left side of the spectrum, um, speaking on how gender identity uh, harms women, erases women. Um, and so you, that would be just another resource in addition to the day's event. This video should be up uh, by the end of the day. You can also see that earlier video, and hopefully that will inspire uh, a national movement. And so last question in the back there. Uh, so in Britain, some of you will be aware, we had our version of the Equality Act with the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, it's my perspective as a journalist that this was actually counterproductive for the trans activists because it sparked a national conversation, it sparked a national debate, and uh, it became very difficult to avoid. Journalists had to respond to this as a news hook. Is the Equality Act, in a sense, an opportunity to spark a national conversation? And if so, how do we do that? I, I want to answer quickly. Um, I would say that one of the significant differences between here and, and the UK is that we, there are journalists in the UK speaking out about it. And here we have, um, I mean, there are journalists speaking out, but not with the sort of national reach and name recognition that, um, that the journalists who are speaking about it in the UK have had. And I think that has made a humongous difference. So, you know, we, we need journalists to be speaking about this and covering both sides of the story at least. You know, I guess I think that if people understood what the Equality Act really means and what it would do, then yes, absolutely. I just think it's an open question about whether we're going to get a fair shot in the media, whether they're going to be willing to hear our voices. They tend to um, give op equal opportunity, so-called, to, to trans activists. If, if anybody writes a critical article uh, in the New York Times or something, they'll put one of the leading trans activists up there to, to counter it. Or there was an article in the Atlantic uh, Monthly a few months ago that sort of explored in a semi-even-handed way um, the whole transgender thing, and it was immediately suppressed, uh, f uh, changed the title so that it was less inflammatory after the fact, and then they ran five articles in a row uh, against it. Uh, the same with uh, the Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria article by Lisa Littman, it was published in August, uh, the trans activists have done nothing but, I mean, they've, they've issued maybe 50 blogs to, to, to say uh, that it's not true. So they come out vituperatively. They come out to, to kill it with fire. And that's what every time in this country. So they, they try to be even-handed, and so they let that happen. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, there are sandwiches out in the foyer, so please um, enjoy some lunch. And please join me in thanking the panelists.